Welcome back to chapter 11. In this video, we're going to talk about three other sections of the chapter now that we've introduced these key ideas of density and pressure. So we're going to start out by figuring out where one of our new key equations comes from. So imagine that we have a container of a fluid, maybe a container of water, and we're specifically looking at a column of this water. Could be any fluid, but it's easy to imagine water. All right, if we think about the forces acting on this water as if it's an object with forces, we can draw a force diagram or a free body diagram. And we can think about what forces are acting here. We have the pressure of the air pushing down on that um, top. So I'm going to call it the force at the top, but we know that that force is coming from pressure, and I'll write it over here, that pressure is force over area. So we'll come back to that idea in just a bit. We also have the force of either our hand, if we imagine holding it like the slide does, or the bottom of the container of fluid. We have a force at the bottom pushing up on this um, column of water. We can think of it as a normal force if we want to, but that force exists because that water is being held up by that. And then right in the middle, um, at the center of gravity, we have gravity itself. So we have the force of gravity. We have, pointing upwards, the force at the bottom. I'm going to call that below. And we have up here the force at the top, and I'm going to call that above, that is pointing downwards. So we're going to draw it downwards, F above. Now if we imagine this water, and again, it's part of a container of water, and that whole container is not moving, that because it's not moving, the net forces are equal to zero. Okay, so so far we really haven't used, besides commenting on the pressure, we really haven't used anything that's not from chapter 4. So we can write out these forces. We have one up and two down, and they have to add up to zero. So we can write that the force below, the one up arrow, minus the force above minus gravity equals zero, okay? So now I want us to think about a couple of key things. So first of all, the force below and force above, they're really coming from pressure, um, at least the above part. But we could write both of these in terms of pressure. So because pressure is force per area, if we look at that same idea, pressure is force per area, and we multiply both sides by pressure, uh, sorry, by area, then instead of force below, we can rewrite that to be the pressure below times the surface area. For the force above, we could do the same thing, the pressure above times the surface area. And then gravity we know is mg, so let's just write that in, mg. Okay, so let's look at what we have um, here. We can simplify a couple of things. So first of all, what I'm gonna do, let me mess up against the painting. Okay. What I want us to think about is the fact that um, with these two terms having area, we could divide all of the terms by area, and that's what I'm going to do next. So I'm going to keep changing colors just so that we can see the new line each time or easily read it. So I'm going to divide all of these terms by area. So we have pressure below minus pressure, oops, pressure above 
minus mg over a equals zero. And then the other small math trick, or um, less math and more thinking about the, uh, the quantities that we've been talking about for fluids, if I take this last term and I multiply the top by h and the bottom by h, then I have not physically changed the value of that term. It's basically multiplying it by 1. But we can see a couple of key things here. Area times height for this particular object. The area is the surface area. The height is the physical difference between the top and the bottom. That area times height is volume. So now what we have is, and I'm just going to erase it with my, um, erase it and replace it. So area times height is volume, so area times height is volume for this particular object, right? If this were a sphere, we would have a different situation, but this is just a rectangular prism. And then mass over volume, this thing I've now circled um, in blue, mass over volume is density. And so what we end up with when we just take these negative terms and add them to both sides. I've kind of run out of space and it's not worth, um, not worth flipping or erasing. But now we have pressure below, if we add this to both sides, equals pressure above plus rho, the thing I circled, times g times h. Now we never have to redo this derivation ourselves, but it is worth making sure we have a sense that it is really just coming from the forces acting on a fluid equaling zero. That's true of static um, problems. Fluid statics is all of chapter 11. So if we think then about an example that we could use this new equation for, so I'm going to write it at the top here, pressure below equals pressure above plus rho g H, where rho is that density idea. It's not a P, it's a rho. Okay. An introductory example that we could practice with, and you'll see some of these in the skill drill and maybe one um, in the problem set, is if we thought about the way that this gets used, it is used to find an unknown pressure given a starting point that we do know. So we are asked to find the pressure 10 meters below the surface of a lake of fresh water. Okay, so here's our nice exciting lake. So maybe we'll have a little sailboat to indicate it's a lake. So there's air up here and there's water down here. Okay, we are asked to compare the surface with a point 10 meters below. So the height here is 10 meters. And we can think about some really key things here. In most of the cases, not all, but in most of the cases that use this equation, one of these pressures is probably going to be the atmospheric pressure if the above or below region is open to the air. We will see examples of both over the course of our slides plus assessments uh, and assignments. But in this case, the top is open to the air. Because it's air there, the above, in this case, not always, we do not want to automatically assume that above is air. That is not a um, good assumption to make. But because we see the air there, the above situation is the atmospheric pressure, newtons per square meter. And the water gives us the density. The density of water is something we could look up. It is a thousand. We do not need to memorize that, but we do need to know that it is a number we can look up as needed. The height we already have and g is 9.8. And so if we look at this top equation here, there is only one unknown, which is the pressure we're looking for. So when we Write that out then. The pressure that we're looking for that's 10 meters below the surface is the pressure above 
this big atmospheric pressure, plus density, 1,000, times G, 9.8, times height, 10. So that pressure is going to be about, um, about double. That's just kind of how it works out, but we'll plug in the numbers. We plug in all of those. And we get 199, 300 newtons per square meter. So that's the pressure 10 meters below the surface of a lake of water, 199,000 newtons per square meter. It's kind of a quick rule of thumb that every 10 meters you go lower in water is going to add another atmosphere's worth of pressure. But that can really add up. At a depth of seven miles, the Mariana Trench in the middle of the ocean, the pressure would be over a thousand times that of atmospheric pressure, which is why it is so difficult to build a um, submersible vehicle that can withstand those pressures to be able to explore it. So these kinds of examples, we will see several of in the assignments. They aren't significantly um, different from one to another, and so we aren't going to see a whole bunch of examples in the slides here. But the process we, we watched, and you can always rewatch, and there are other examples in the um, additional, additional problems, the extra practice set. Okay, so real-world applications of this pressure variation um, can be found all over the place. Two very common examples in healthcare if you need um, blood uh, from a blood bag or a um, saline drip, anything where you need a fluid injected into your veins, they often raise that bag up so that the um, higher location of the blood bag is at a lower pressure. And so we're basically letting gravity create a higher pressure to get the um, fluid where it needs to go in our, um, in our system. For a dam that is built to hold back water, we can't just build a straight normal wall. That won't work um, for the water because the deeper that we go, the higher and higher forces are acting on each little portion of the um, dam wall. And um, it needs to be built to be a lot thicker and more stable below uh, and a little bit thinner at the top. Uh, kind of like it's drawn here. Because the pressure is getting larger and larger, which means the force is getting larger and larger as we go deeper underwater. Now, what's worth recognizing is that if we have several different containers that are all open to the air at the top, like these five are, and they are all containing the same fluid, so the density is the same, then everywhere along the black line that is drawn is exactly the same pressure. So it's not specifically the column of water overhead, because if we think, for example, at the last, uh, the furthest right shape here, what we have is we could be out in that little corner of that um, little plus cross-shaped um, container, and there's not actually a whole lot of physical water above us, but the pressure has to be the same as you move sideways in a stationary fluid. Because if there was a pressure difference, there would be a net force and the fluid would flow to fix that pressure difference. The reason that there can be a pressure difference moving up and down without flow is because of the force of gravity that balances out that difference. So that's something worth making sure we understand and don't just kind of write down and move on from. Okay. So we can think of a couple of other numeric situations where this pressure difference within a fluid um, can be useful for us. There are um, tools called barometers that measure pressure. Often they measure atmospheric pressure because although we know that the um, atmospheric pressure is supposed to be that 101,300 newtons per square meter, that doesn't mean it is at all points in time, at all locations. That's just a standard value. 
So if we really cared about measuring the actual number value, we could build something like what is shown on our slide here, where there is a vacuum at the top of that central column. A vacuum, it is worth writing this down if it isn't clear to us um, from the start, the word vacuum in a physics sense means that the pressure is effectively zero. So if there is no air up there, it is a vacuum, zero pressure, then the pressure above in this situation is zero, and then we use the height and density of the liquid to figure out what the pressure below would be, and we could read it off as a um, number value for the pressure. If we had little marks, for example, there would be a mark that was the standard, and if the water level rose higher, it meant that the air was pushing more on the fluid than it normally does, kind of pushing it up into the tube. That would be a higher atmospheric pressure, bigger height. And if the pressure was lower than it normally is, it means the air is actually pushing less than it normally does. It's lower pressure than standard. That smaller height creates a smaller pressure below value. In the past, before we knew the problems with using liquid mercury in everyday instruments, this was often built using mercury, where the height value for the atmospheric pressure standard was 760 millimeters. So there would be little marks in units of millimeters of mercury. That is actually a unit that people still use as just a unit for pressure even though millimeters is a length unit. The unit for pressure is millimeters of mercury, the whole phrase. So 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. The reason why mercury was used is because if we needed to build this barometer using water, for example, much less dense than liquid mercury, it would take 10.3 meters of water, like a four or five story building, to be able to have the standard height represented. So we could do it, um, but it wouldn't be very practical for a desk-based um, pressure, uh, pressure instrument. Now, mercury was used for a lot of different scientific instruments. So the full numeric um, discussion of this one, both using the somewhat straightforward millimeters of mercury, once we get the hang of them, we'll see that the calculation is very straightforward using them, but we'll also use the standard units, but that's going to have its own separate example video, the way that we have seen in the past. What I do want us to think about for this slide before we move on from it, is that just looking at this picture, we should be able to have a sense of whether the gas pressure is higher or lower than atmospheric pressure. So look at where the mercury, where the mercury levels are on the left and the right side of this tube and try to decide which one is really pushing harder, the gas or the air. So pause the video if you need to think about it. Okay, and hopefully because we saw that the um, fluid was higher on the gas side, it means the air is winning that kind of pushing tug of war and is shoving all of the mercury off um, center. If they were lined up, they would have the same pressure. But what we see is that the gas pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure. And just to give away the punchline for the millimeters of mercury units, it's lower by 35 millimeters of mercury. And so instead of 760 millimeters of mercury being the pressure, it would be 725 millimeters of mercury being the pressure. But we will see those number values worked out in example 11a, a separate video. Now a couple of other small details from this chapter before we close up this um, video. Pascal's principle is um, an interesting one to read about in the book. It's section 11.5, where if we think about a um, container of fluid that is fully filled by that fluid, there is no empty air, there's no vacuum, it is a fully contained fluid, then if we push on one side of um, that container, it will send the same pressure through the whole fluid. This is how hydraulic lifts um, can work, where a small force applied over a small area can balance out a really big force applied over a much bigger area as well. 
So if you're interested in this, it's not really a key aspect to our curriculum, um, but if you're interested in this, it may be worth reading through um, this section of the textbook in a little bit more detail uh, for, for other applications of this pressure as well, uh, this Pascal's principle. It is also worth noting that tires in general have pressurized air that fill the tire, fill the space, and so that, that air is at roughly the same pressure throughout the tire. And when we want to check that tire pressure, we just do so through the, um, the little gauge there that is also used to fill the tire back up again. A single measurement tells us the pressure throughout the tire. But consider what that temperature or that pressure gauge is actually telling us. If you have ever had a flat tire, I have had more than one flat tire in my life. If you have a pressure gauge with you and you put it up against the tire because you're not quite sure if it's flat, uh, that pressure gauge would read zero if it were a truly flat tire. And if you read a really small number, you know that, you know, you've got to fix that tire before you keep driving on it. But when the gauge reads zero, it is not telling you that the inside of your tire is a vacuum, right? Zero pressure would be a vacuum. Instead, all that gauge is telling you is that the difference between the pressure inside your tire and the pressure outside of your tire, that difference is zero. So the gauge reading compares the two pressures and tells you the difference. Which means that we can think about a quick little example with this idea. Let's say that we measure the pressure in this particular tire and the gauge itself reads 35 pounds per square inch. What would the real pressure be in the tire? If you didn't write down or don't remember the um, atmospheric pressure in these units, it's worth pausing the video, rewinding it, or pulling up the slides. But try this one to see if it makes sense what the real pressure would be if the gauge reads 35 pounds per square inch. Okay, hopefully we realize that all we need to do is take that 35 and add it to the 15 or the 14.7 um, pounds per square inch that is the atmospheric pressure in these units. And so our absolute pressure would be 50 pounds per square inch. The actual tire pressure is 50. It's just 35 PSI above the atmosphere. All right, so that wraps up three sections out of the chapter, and the next video is the most important single video from this set, uh, and it goes into Archimedes' principle and buoyant force. So I will see you in that next lecture video.